I'm Leander Delisle, and I love the Tudors Dynasty podcast. This is the Tudors Dynasty podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to episode 106. As always, I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. On this episode, I chat with Dr. Wendy J. Dunn on the subject of her new book, Maria de Salinas. Then, Shakespeare historian Cassidy Cash is back as the expert to answer the Shakespeare questions you submitted. And lastly, Steph does a beautiful job giving us a brief history on Lady Catherine Gray. You don't want to miss a moment of this show. Before we get into it, I want to thank my new patrons since the last episode. Anna Paula L., Margaret W., Scott M., Go Kate 206 Monique M., Jessica C., and Paula T. A big thank you to you guys and to all my existing patrons. If you'd like to become a patron, you can do so by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty, and then click Become a Patron for options. As a patron, you'll receive access to exclusive content from the show, as well as free books and the Tudor course. I'm also working on new patron gifts for the near future. See show notes at TudorsDynastyPodcast.com for links to Patreon, as well as links and more from our guests. If you don't already, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Um, Now is the time. On Tuesdays, I do Name That Place, where I'll share an image of a building and you try to guess its name. To help, I'll give you two clues. Then on Wednesdays, I do a Tudor Spotlight where I pick one lesser known character and I give you a brief history on them. Then it's Thursday Feature Book Day where I share an image of a book I have and a brief description of its contents. Lastly, we all love to test our Tudor knowledge. So on Fun Day Friday, we test our knowledge on Tudor history with one trivia question. See how much you know and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as at Tudors Dynasty. And also, please subscribe to the podcast. Thanks for listening. All right, let's get on with the show. Wendy, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Rebecca. It's lovely to be back. So the last time you were on, we talked about Catherine of Aragon. And today we are going to discuss a woman who really, I think, is rarely discussed. But when her name is brought up, everyone listens. And I'm talking about Maria de Salinas. I always have such a hard time with that name. Me too. So you guys know who I'm talking about. Um, Wendy's new book, All Manner of Things, really shines the light upon Maria and her relationship with Catherine of Aragon. Wendy, what drew you to Maria's story? Well, really, it was the story about what happened at the end of their lives um, when Catherine was dying and Maria rode from London um, to, to where Catherine was virtually imprisoned um, and away from everybody that was important to her. Um, Maria had no permission to go because at that stage you needed permission to be with um, Catherine um, and she just got on a horse. A woman who was probably 50 um, rode in winter in really bad weather conditions. She actually fell from her horse. Um, And then when she arrived at the castle where Catherine was, she just insisted that she would be allowed in because she was injured and it was against the laws of hospitality to um, let her be there on a winter evening um, all hurt and um, so they allowed her in as, and as soon as she was in the castle, she slipped away and she found Catherine's room and she stayed with her until Catherine died. And I think that just shows you what kind of woman Maria was. And that was the, that was the starting point of my interest in her. I thought, my God, what a woman. Mm. She's amazing. I have to give voice to her one day in my writing. And I have. Now I have. 
So Eustace Chapuis, he doesn't really appear to have been a fan of Maria. And I saw this letter where he states that the Queen Catherine loved Maria over any other mortal and that she had a strong influence over the Queen. Now, do you believe that Catherine was really pliable? Well, the thing is that um, Maria was one of um, Catherine's closest friends. Now, we're talking about the ambassador to Spain. Um, Maria would have been um, feeling very protective of Catherine at that stage too. So um, she would be very, very careful about who she allowed to access. And that's one of the, um, with a woman in her position of um, being so close to Catherine, um, she was one of those people that allowed access to Catherine. Um, as to whether Catherine was pliable, um, Catherine was um, a woman who, if she loved someone and trusted someone, yes, she was pliable. But if that person betrayed them, um, betrayed Catherine, then she never forgave that person, um, especially if it was a woman that um, she had a, uh, a, another Spanish uh, girl um, that betrayed her during her seven years of being in that dark, despairing time of limbo before she married Henry VIII. And, um, and uh, Francesca, um, I've forgotten her surname, ended up marrying the money lender that was Catherine was actually quite in debt to too. But... Um, because this this young woman was seeking ex escape. They had been in England for seven years. None of them knew what was going to happen to Catherine. Catherine was at the point of begging to go home. She wanted to take the veil. Um, she was just fed up with this really horrible time where she was a pawn between her father and her her father-in-law. Um, and, of course, when Francesca um, married the moneylender, she, she saw it as a great betrayal and never, never forgave her. So, yes, it depended on how much, um, how close the person was and if Catherine loved that person. Yes, she would be pliable if, if she was betrayed then she would be like a stone she would not be wanting that person returned to her so I hope that answers that question <laughs> Well, that's interesting. And I'm glad that you mentioned um, her father, too, because that's one of the instances that I always think about where it seemed at the beginning of her reign with Henry VIII that she, her father really had her ear at that moment. Oh, yes. It's, it's, it really astounds me about um, Catherine's relationship with her father. Um, it it appears to me that she really wanted to be loyal to him no matter what, even though um, for seven years she was really betrayed by him over and over and over. He just ignored her letters. Um, he just left her out in the cold. He, he didn't, um, I mean, he didn't pay her dowry, so that meant that her income was very, very, very um, limited. Um, they were struggling to um she was struggling to maintain her household uh and as a princess of um two royal kingdoms um yeah it was it was a very dark time for her um he did make her father did make her uh, one of the uh, one of the um great kindness he did to her at the last stage of that seven year period was to make her his ambassador to Henry the seventh and that gave her her income and I think um after that you know she did feel great responsibility to do that job well because she was brought up to be a queen and um you know, serving the kingdom and doing the right thing by England and also by her father was one of those things that she was trained to do. Well, let's step back a little bit to 
Um, well, you know, we were already talking about the beginning of the reign with Henry VIII, but for those who are unfamiliar with the history, by the time Catherine became queen in 1509, how long had she known Maria? Um, I believe they knew each other all their lives. There is an academic um, journal article that was just published in 2016, and it's by an American professor, and it's actually um, for a Spanish um, journal, and it's luckily it's been translated into English. This woman um, actually looked at the household of um, Catholic, uh, Catalina's life when she was in um, her mother's kingdom of Castile. Um, Maria, she identified as being part of um, Catherine's growing up years, which is what I've taken as my framework for my story. So they knew each other according to this journal article. And like I said, it was published only four years ago. So it's very recent and um, and I was very reassured to see that she actually looked at the household documents as to see who were part of um, Catherine's life as a young girl and Maria was part of that. So, um, And there's other historians that also identify Maria as being part of friends' early life. So, but the, of course, all these things can be um, debated. And um, I, I know what, I know that there is some evidence to say that maybe she was not, she did not, Maria did not come over with Catherine in 1501 with the the party of of Spanish people that came with Catherine and stayed with her. But I do find it interesting that they, this also this um, theory is claiming that Maria arrived after Arthur's death. This is when Arthur was after his death. People were leaving Catherine back for Spain. In fact, a lot of um, Spanish people left even before Cap, um, Arthur died. One of the things that they did in this period of time was to try and, if you had a, a foreign princess, is that they they tried not to have too many of her own people there, so that you know she was definitely integrated into um, England. So you know it was quite very normal for a king to send back um, the people that came over with um, a foreign princess returned to sender and um, so that that person, um, princess, would then loyal to England rather than continue loyalty to another country. One of the topics that listeners often ask about are the duties of the Queen's servants. Do you have any idea or can you tell us a little bit about like what Maria's everyday duties would have looked like? Well, this is the thing is that these women, um, even though they were of noble birth, it was considered to be a great, great privilege to be serving the royals and um, the closer you were, the more intimate your service was. And as you probably know, um, Henry VIII had someone that dealt with his toilet duties. And that, uh, and that I mean toilet duties. Um, he had a man that wiped his bottom, I believe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, was there um, while he was on the stool, um, on the privy. Um, and so... Com- what happened with Henry VIII would be would have been comparable to the Queen as well. Um, and, of course, being a woman, um, she needed to have, um, well, she would have been a, a, of child, she was of childbearing age for oh, how many years of their, oh, well, she would have been of childbearing age when she came to England when she was 15. So, of course, she's got, her period, um, all those sort of things. So these people were there to ensure that, um, you know, if she had a runny nose, you know, they could give her a, I mean, there's a, a story about Anne Boleyn at her coronation. Um, one of the women there um, actually had a hanky for Anne Boleyn to spit in because Anne Boleyn was actually quite nauseous because she was pregnant. Um so they looked after the, the royal person in a very intimate way and they saw it as being a great privilege. It does sound very intimate. 
well, this is this is a very um, and and they like I said, it was a great privilege for these women. To, uh, the closer you could be to the royal person, the better. So, right, and then of course, as a as a servant um, of the queen, her ladies would have hoped to make a good marriage, right? Of course. And that was another thing that was part of the Queen's duty was to take on unmarried girls and it was sort of like a finishing school for these unmarried girls. Um, You've got noble families really wanting to ensure that their daughters ended up being in some attending to the Queen. So it's not so much being a servant but an attendant to the Queen. So, um, yes, they, they would be placed with Catherine and hopefully they would then find a good catch amongst the nobles um, there. So, yes, and she would be responsible to ensure that those girls behaved themselves and, um, yeah. So how long did it take after um, Catherine became queen before Maria got married. She was she was actually married quite late um, for a Tudor woman, fifteen, uh, fifteen, sixteen. So if she was of the same age as um, Catherine, that makes her close to thirty or thirty. So as I don't know Maria's age, this is she's really in the shadows of history, um, but I can only assume that she was close to Catherine's age. Um, I find that really interesting, um, but Maria definitely did not want to leave the service of Catherine of Aragon, which was lovely. Um, she was so devoted to Catherine. Um I can't, you know, this is this is the thing is that why did she wait so long to marry? Because it is very strange for a Tudor woman to be 30 um, when she has her first marriage. They considered that as being quite ancient. <laughs> it, makes you, it makes somebody wonder if maybe it's just, just her loyalty. Yes, I think it could have been. I mean, my, my novel sort of... Um, Suggest. I mean, I, I was wondering if it was because um, she did meet her husband earlier on when they arrived in 1501, but he was he was a married man, um, and so she, he was unavailable to marry. And I mean, this is my what ifs as a fiction writer. I have no idea if that's for true or not, but um, makes for a good story. Um, it just makes it um, – there was a time where um, when she was um, with Caf- Catherine during that seven years of limbo when um, it was suggested that she could go home to marry someone, but she needed a dowry and um, Catherine's, hus- um, Catherine's father, again, failed to provide that dowry. So that left her um, unable to do other anything other than stay with Catherine. Because, of course, you know, these, these women, um, their roles were um, not only to serve um, the royal, royals but to, to, to find a marriage. I mean, these, these women at this time, their, their two narratives was marriage or they could join a religious order. So that's their two narratives. It was very unusual for a woman to remain unmarried of that status. That's fascinating. And, of course, Mm. we see as both women aged, Maria, unfortunately, had to see her friend's marriage fall apart, of course, with the king's great matter. Was Maria outwardly defiant over the king's behavior? It seems so, Rebecca, um, because in 1532... Henry VIII sent Maria away from court. And, of course, 1532 was the time when everything was unravelling for for Catherine of Aragon. Um, yeah, so she was definitely shown the door and um, unwelcome, no longer welcome at court. 
It's sad. Mm. And then we look at, you know, 1533, you know, the queen is still experiencing extreme hardship at the hand of the king. Maria's daughter, Catherine Willoughby, who many will recognize that name, was married to Charles Brandon. Now, I'm curious, even though Catherine was Brandon's ward, did Maria consent to the marriage with him? Do we know? Well, the thing is that as um, Catherine's daughter was now the ward of Brandon, she wouldn't have had any say anymore about she basically had given away the rights to her da- daughter's decision about who's who's going to be the husband or, of um, Catherine. Um, actually, it's quite interesting. I, I, the way I understand it, the way my research has shown, is that um, Catherine was placed with um, Charles Brandon and Mary Tudor as a young girl and it seems that it could have been because um, Catherine's uncle um, wanted to encroach on um, um, Catherine's properties and, you know, try try to get things that belonged to this young little girl because she was only small. She was only about five years old when her father passed away. So, um, of course, Maria... um, she had no um, family in England to help protect her daughter's rights. Um, so I do, and of, of course at that time um, things were getting very shaky for Catherine of Aragon, so she no longer had the power that she used to have to be able to sway um, Henry VIII to do the, do the right thing. Um, so I, I do believe that... Um, the reason that she chose to place her daughter as um, Charles Brandon's ward was because it would protect her daughter. And um, Charles Brandon and Mary Tudor had a son, and I think from what my research indicates is that the expectation was that Catherine would one day marry the son, not the father, because, you know, um, Maria... Um, actually knew um, Mary Tudor from the time she was only a five-year-old. They were friends, um, and she was friends with Charles Brandon too because Charles, um, Charles Brandon made a, a godmother of one of, her, one of his children um, of one of his earlier marriages. Um, so they did have a close association, um, but... Mary Tudor died in 1533. This is the sister of Henry VIII. And only about three weeks later, it was only a very, very short time, he then marries his ward, Catherine Willoughby. And I think from what I understand, from my research, is that his son was... um, diagnosed by the doctors as having the lung disease, consumption, and expected to die. And um, so Charles Brandon would no longer have an heir once that boy had passed away, and it was important for Charles Brandon to have an heir. Um, And there you've got a young girl who's been with the family since five-year-old, trained to be the new Duchess after she got married to his son. So there's she's trained already. She's of childbearing age. Well, she was actually only, I think, only 14, which makes me really quite uh, horrible, you know, horrifies me, the thought, because he was 48 and she was so young. Yeah, it's gross. <laughs> yeah, it is gross. It is gross. By by modern standards, we have to remind ourselves. I know, I know, but later on, Catherine, who was, of course, an heiress and she was very wealthy all through her life, when she had her own children um, and uh, who was it? Um, but when, when one of the people high up in the court of Elizabeth I wanted to marry one of his children to Catherine's children, she said one of the most wicked and unkind things that you could do as a parent was to 
to contract your children in a marriage without them wanting to be married to that person. So that that actually got me thinking that of that that's coming from a place of um, personal experience. That Catherine, um, I mean, she would have been brought up to regard Brandon as a father, not not as a potential husband. Um, she would have been looking at his son Henry as her potential husband, and um, and Henry was still alive when um, this marriage took place, and he was actually um, they reckon his death was hastened because he had a broken heart, the young boy. So that's such a sad little story there. It is. Uh, Well, let's talk a little bit more maybe about the relationship between Maria and her daughter, Catherine, because from your book, and you know I've been reading it, I wish I had more time, but I'm probably five chapters into it. And, of course, I absolutely love the way you tell the story. And the inspiration for your book is um, a letter from Maria to her daughter, right? Yes. What kind of relationship did Maria have with her daughter too? Well, this is, it's all very curious. I, I mean, the thing is that Maria is very much in the shadows. I don't know what kind of relationship they, they had because the fact is that Catherine was raised by Maria, by Mary Tudor and Charles Brandon. She was in their household from the time she was five. So, uh, and Maria lived um, either at court with Catherine of Aragon or when she was ejected from court, um, she had a London home because she was, um, you know, she had her own home in London as well so she was quite a distance she was quite a distance away from her daughter because they they lived um oh, it would have taken them days and days to get to uh where the Brandons lived so I think their relationship was pretty limited but um, okay. I I do think that story about what Catherine said as a as a mother later on in her life the fact that the most unkind and unwicked a wicked thing that you could do as a parent was to uh, con- contract your child into a marriage without their consent that really indicates to me that the relationship was not um you know, of the best, you know, that that there may have, may have been resentment. Ugh, I can't imagine um, what kind of conversation you can have with somebody who's, you know, 30 plus years older than you. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. And he, because in, in this period of time, Rebecca, um, they, they did, they were aware that 14 was too young to, to, to be bedded when you're wedded. I mean, you've got, the story of Henry Fitzroy, who was 17, and his wife, um, Mary Howard, who was 16, um, kept in separate households because they were re- regarded as still too young to be um, having a full marriage. Um, they, they did know that to, um, for a girl to be 14 and pregnant, that was taking a risk with her life. Um, but he, he got her pregnant straight away. She had two children very quickly into the marriage. So he didn't wait. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up because that's a subject, um, that I have studied a little bit where the laws in England are a little bit different than maybe how the people felt. And I think the story you just told kind of shows that since they could get married at 12, but legally they couldn't consummate the marriage until there were 14. But we do see the instances like with Mary Howard and Henry Fitzroy, where others stepped in and said, no, we're going to wait a little bit longer. Yeah. And that was more usual than, than 
having a, a young girl of, I mean, you got this, this story of, of course, Margaret Beaufort, who was only 13 when she had Henry VII, uh, um, and that supposedly um, wrecked her body. Um, she actually, there's a letter that she wrote at the time that Margaret Tudor, her granddaughter, was um, 14 when she married. Um, I, I'm not very good with my Sc- um, Scottish king's numbers. Was it James the Fourth? Yeah, Margaret Tudor married James the Fourth of Scotland. Yeah, James the Fourth, and so she was concerned because James the Fourth was 25. So he, she was really worried that he would not wait until she was, you know, her do- granddaughter was um, old enough and mature enough in the body. And she, um, Margaret was actually very short, which indicates also that because once a, a, um, a way I understand um, this kind of thing is that uh, if a girl has a baby, that stops their growing in height. Interesting. So, I mean, it must have been. Um, can you just imagine? Oh, it makes me creep. Oh, <laughs> So, you know, she she was she never and also of course Margaret Beaufort was married um was it three more times after Edmund Tudor? Two two or three. Yeah. She never had another child. She never had another child. I can't even imagine. Yeah, I was twenty five when I had my daughter and that was <laughs> she destroyed me. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we know these things, don't we? So, um, yeah. So she was, you know, Margaret Beaufort was very concerned about that um, James the Fourth would not wait until Mar- um, Margaret Tudor was ready and old enough to be of childbearing age properly. So earlier on, you had mentioned um, the story, which is also my favorite story about Maria, the her, you know, disobeying the king and rushing to see her friend at the end of her life. And I think the question that I've always had, and I'm sure others have too, is obviously you don't defy Henry VIII. So what punishment did she receive for her disobedience? As far as I can see, really no punishment. But but then she was exiled from the court. So he probably regarded that as well. She was um, no longer part of the court. And in this period of time, if you were no longer welcome at court, then that was sort of like you're in the dark place as a, um, a noble person in this particular time. I suspect, I suspect, I, I, I have never read what actually happened afterwards, Rebecca, but I suspect that um, Henry VIII would have asked Brandon to have a really firm talking with his mother-in-law about, you know, that she really took a chance there, um, that she could have ended up in the Tower of London. That's a great point. And, yeah, she was just not no longer welcomed at court after that. I mean, she was from 1532, from what I understand, is that she no longer um, was in that, you know, the, the wonderful glory of what Henry VIII's called, as if we would really want to be in that situation of doing the deadly dance of the Tudors. Right. That It's so difficult because you obviously you would want the king's favor because without it, you're the black sheep. Yeah. Yeah. But with it, then you have a horrible life. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So do we know what year she died? Yes, she died three years after um, Catherine of Aragon. So so the um, date that I have in the be- beginning of my book is the year that she died. And the lo- there's another lovely story about Maria too. Um, they believe, I mean, this is another legend, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's true. Maria asked her a heart to be buried with Catherine of Aragon. Oh. Well, I reckon it is true. I want that to be true. I love to, I love it to be discovered if it is, but I yes, it's it just yes, it's it's something that they did in that period of time. If they loved a place or loved a person, then they would often 
you know, ask for their heart to be embalmed and left in that with that person or place, just like Arthur asked for his heart to be embalmed and left at Ludlow. Oh, Wendy, thank you so much for giving us an insight into Maria and her relationships, not only with the queen, but with her daughter and others as well. So before we get to the next part, I just want to say, if you are listening right now and our conversation has piqued to your interest on this subject, Wendy, where can they find your books? Usual, the usual online places. Um, and, of course, you can order them um, through libraries too. I love to have my books at public libraries, so don't be scared to go into a public library and ask for the book to be ordered there. Um, but, yeah, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and um, all – actually, I've got – my two Catherine of Aragon novels at all the usual online places, not just at Amazon now. So it's everywhere, Apple, Google, everywhere. So Perfect. And I'll include links in the show notes too. So if you want quick access to our books, all you'll have to do is click a link. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That's lovely. Yeah. Now, before I let you go, though, we have to play the season's game, Wendy. It's you got me really quite worried about this game, Rebecca. <laughs> okay, so the game is called If I Made You Choose. And basically all it is is I list two figures from Tudor history that I want you to choose from. And then just a quick reason why. We don't need to go into detail, but just a quick, here's who I pick and here's why. Okay, so Wendy, are you ready to play If I Made You Choose? Do I have any choice? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the first one um, you have to pick between is Anne Boleyn or Catherine of Aragon. Oh, my God. That is terrible. I am torn between two queens, you know. This is really hard. Oh, um, oh, shivers. Um, oh, I can't. I want both of them. <laughs> Truly. I knew this one was going to be hard for you. That's why I picked it. <laughs> No, it's impossible. No, I love them both. I love, I'm devoted to both of them. Okay, I'll I'll let you get away with that one. But the next three you have to answer. Is that a deal? All right. Okay, so number two, since you won't pick between Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon, I'll give you that because you've researched and written about them both. This one you're going to hate me for as well. Catherine Carey or Maria de Salinas. All right. You know, I think it'll have to be Catherine Carey because I'm actually writing a, my first nonfiction book about her. So it has to be about her because that will be um, where I'll be, uh, I'm going to be devoting a lot of time to Catherine Carey this year. Wonderful. Okay, so number three is Queen Elizabeth I or Anne Boleyn? Oh, Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I is actually my first... Um, she was my first hero as, as a 10-year-old and I often think to myself that all my writing and all my research is just leading up to the time I feel brave enough to write my Elizabeth's first novel. So one day it's going to happen. It has to happen. <laughs> you will will it to happen. I will will it to happen. <laughs> okay, now the last one is one that every guest from this season has had to answer. It's a little bit self-serving as well. <laughs> this one is, would you choose, if I made you choose, Thomas Seymour or Edward Seymour? Oh, Thomas. Thomas is interesting. Thomas, um, yeah, he was definitely had the more charm. He had, well, to me, it seems like he had definitely the more charm than, than he's his brother seems a bit cold. Do you think that, Rebecca? Well, I'm a huge Thomas fan, so I, I agree. Mm. <laughs> well, Wendy, thank you so much for playing the game and for coming on today to discuss the subjects of your book, All Manner of Things. Thank you, Rebecca, for having me. Where... Where can everybody find you if they want to connect and ask you questions and stuff? I have a um, Facebook author page. Um, on, I have a web page. Um, I'm on Twitter. And I'm, 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 
everywhere on <laughs> online. So I'm easily easily found. <laughs> well, perfect. And I love, I love people, um, especially if people who enjoyed my books. I love to hear from people that uh, have enjoyed my books. It really means a lot to me to hear that because it keeps me it keeps me writing for the public. And they're fantastic books. So I will also include the links to your social media in the show notes so everybody can connect with you. Wendy, thanks again. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. It's lovely speaking to you and catching up with you. And now, Ask the Expert. Our guest on Ask the Expert today is Shakespeare expert Cassidy Cash. Cassidy is the amazingly talented host of that Shakespeare Life podcast. Cassidy, welcome to Ask the Expert. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, I, I think you're probably new to this. So Ask the Expert is a new segment this season, and I was really looking for a way to better connect my listeners with my guests. And what better way than giving them the opportunity to ask their questions? So today, Cassidy Cash, you won't be answering my questions, but the questions of the curious listeners. Oh, wow. Well, excellent. We'll see how we do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're ready. The first one was submitted by multiple people. So bear with me here. It was at Delicate Bliss and at Nancy Buchanan 71 on Twitter, as well as um, Emily McNeely 1978. And I'd say on Instagram, as well as Stacey M. Stark on Facebook. So quite a few people had this question. I have a feeling you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> yes, I, I can feel this one coming from across the room. <laughs> so we often hear rumors about Sir Francis Bacon, Edward de Vere, or others being the true author of Shakespeare's work. What can you tell us about these rumors? Yes. Well, I should start by saying I'm not an expert in conspiracy theories across the board. So as a rule... I, I don't follow most of them. And these really fall into that category. They're both um, the two main ones that you mentioned, the Baconian theory and then the Edward de Vere is sometimes called Oxfordian theory. Those two are the ones you're going to hear about most, but there are others because just they come up, but they're both fairly new. The the idea of asking these questions I felt like was a good thing to do. I support the whole approach of saying, do we really know what we think we know? And especially after we've had people like Mark Twain and George Eliot who taught us, you can't take an author's name at face value. I think these questions kind of came up and we want to think, well, Mark Twain wasn't Mark Twain. He was someone else. So maybe Shakespeare was actually someone else. And But I think when it comes to the life of William Shakespeare, the case is very, very strong that he was who he claimed to be. There's tremendous evidence in the way of primary documents, letters, diaries, textual evidence, personal testimonies, archaeological evidence. And there's just a lot to suggest that Shakespeare was William Shakespeare from Stratford-upon-Avon. Not that I felt like it was a bad idea to say, do we really know that? But these two theories that your listeners have asked about, the first one gets kind of debunked for me because it didn't come up until the mid 19th century. It's this idea that Bacon's ideas seem similar to ones found in Shakespeare's plays. So Bacon must be Shakespeare. I just feel like that's too large of a leap. And they go way over into cryptographic theories with ciphers and coded messages and things like that, which I just felt like to me, it doesn't hold water, but it's worth looking into if you are into that kind of thing. I just don't think the history backs that up. The Oxfordian theory is the idea that Edward de Vere was really Shakespeare. The claim here was that there's this giant falsification effort to create a fake playwright named Shakespeare and that it was really Edward de Vere all the time. This one is pretty easy to disprove because Edward de Vere died in 1604, and there are at least 12 plays that are attributed to Shakespeare that were written after that. So either Edward de Vere pulled a James Bond and he passed the torch on to the next person to play Shakespeare, or Edward de Vere couldn't have been Shakespeare. I don't hold to either of these theories myself. Um, but I mean, that's they are what they are. I think if you're new to William Shakespeare, you should really go through the history and look at the life of the man himself. Shakespeare Birthplace Trust is a great, solid place to start when looking looking into that and obviously for me myself i believe that william shakespeare of stratford upon avon wrote the plays attributed to him um i do think he had several co-authors which might give credence to some of these some of these series as people think well he wrote them with someone else um 
but I also don't think that having a co-author negates a man's entire existence. So, you know, there's some room to think through that kind of stuff. You make a great argument. And also, am I mistaken, but wasn't Edward de Vere also rumored to have been a child of Queen Elizabeth I? There's all kind of rumors about Edward de Vere. <laughs> what an intriguing character. <laughs> He seems to have conspiracy theories. Follow him wherever he goes. Oh, poor guy. <laughs> so along the same lines, we had um, at Ellie Webster on Instagram. She asked, is there any truth behind Shakespeare in love? Well, I love this question because I love this movie. And as a Shakespeare historian, I probably should not because they mess up the history so bad in that movie. But it's so good. It's a fa fabulous movie. Um, but no, there's not much truth about Shakespeare, at least. Um, this film did inspire an episode of our show on that Shakespeare life. However, when I was first getting started with YouTube episodes, one of the questions we asked was whether or not Shakespeare had a toothbrush. Because in the film Shakespeare in Love, Gwyneth Paltrow's character brushes her teeth with what was supposed to look like this rudimentary wooden toothbrush. It has bristles on one end and, you know, you can tell visually that it's supposed to be a toothbrush. But when I went looking, it turns out that he would not have had a toothbrush like that during Shakespeare's lifetime through until about the 18th century. Toothbrushes were like almost all of the new items of the day considered this very luxury thing. So they made them out of like silver and gold and sort of high fluting things. But there were things that you would like put on your shelf to show that you could own them. Not very many people actually brushed their teeth. And in fact, there's an 18th century dentist that's considered today to be the father of modern dentistry who told people using a cloth would was better than the bristle brushes because the bristles could damage your teeth. So if his recommendation is any indication of Shakespeare's life, actually bristled toothbrushes wouldn't have been the thing to use anyhow. But that that's how movies like that can inspire you to explore history. And it certainly did for me. So no, there's, there's not. I'm sorry, but it's still a great movie. They just really had oral hygiene wrong back then, didn't they? I think so. Yeah, that and thinking that losing all of your blood at one time was a cure for everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, let's release all this blood from you and make you weak. That or make you feel better. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't think so. <laughs> or here, take this honey and rub it all over your teeth. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that seems that seems good. Yeah, right to us, of course. Well, Cassie, we've now obviously established that there's really no reason to think that Shakespeare wasn't the man behind the masterpieces. And Wendy, Wendy McKee Vosper on Instagram wants to know how often did Shakespeare collaborate with other writers? And you kind of mentioned this a little bit. So I'm interested to hear more. Yes, actually, this is a fun one. He collaborated with other writers a lot. Collaboration in Elizabethan and then later Jacobean theater during Shakespeare's lifetime was the industry standard. So not just Shakespeare, but anyone who was a good playwright and trying to make it in this industry, that's what they did. It was quite normal for playwrights to work together on plays. One great example of this is the duo Beaumont and Fletcher. John Fletcher is the man who would go on to take over the King's Men after Shakespeare died. Shakespeare collaborated with Fletcher on over... Well, I forget how many exactly, but he collaborated with Fletcher a lot and Fletcher, Fletcher collaborated with Beaumont on over a dozen plays. Um, the ones that we know Shakespeare collaborated with John Fletcher on are Henry VIII, Two Noble Kinsmen, and then there's a lost play called Cardenio, which we know existed, but we don't actually have a copy of it. And then Fletcher would go on to complete a play called Tamer Tamed, which was thought to be the sequel to Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew. And while it's not been uniformly accepted, meaning a great many people actually doubt the veracity of what I'm fixing to say, there are some historians who believe George Peel helped Shakespeare write Titus Andronicus. It's thought that Thomas Kidd helped Shakespeare write Edward III. It was actually published anonymously in 1596 when Shakespeare was 32. And when he wasn't satirizing his friends in pamphlets, Thomas Nash collaborated with playwrights like Shakespeare and Ben Jonson. Thomas Nash worked with Shakespeare on Henry VI part one. So it was happening all the time, not just from Shakespeare, but a whole, whole lot of these playwrights. And actually, there's a great book on Shakespeare's collaborations by Eric Rasmussen and Jonathan Bate called William Shakespeare and Others Collaborative Plays. Um, and we had Eric Rasmussen on the show at That Shakespeare Life. So there's a whole episode on that if you want to go further into the world of collaborations and Shakespeare. 
Yeah, definitely. If you haven't checked out Cassidy's podcast yet, definitely check it out because you're going to learn some things that you probably have never even considered learning about before. So it's a good one. Moving on to another question from Instagram. Now, this one, the handle on Instagram scared me a little bit because it's El Chapo. And I was like, isn't that the name of a drug lord? <laughs> <laughs> El Chapo was asking us questions. Oh, good. Well, what does what does El Chapo have for us? <laughs> El Chapo would like to know who were the inspirations for the sonnets? Oh, dear. That's a lovely one. Um, that goes right up there with the authorship question, I think. Um, sonnets actually were commissioned by patrons. Um, usually, they were what playwrights would do when they weren't in the theater. So not just as a second form of income, even though that was a second form of income, but also like during times of plague, they would reach out to sonnets as, as a way to make money when the theater was low. Um, but it's important to remember that sonnets are poems. And the English degree in me just screams that it's important to remember the intentional fallacy. Authors of any poetry and even Shakespeare's sonnets don't have to be biographical. They're not meant to be representations of Shakespeare's opinions on things, and they don't have to have actually been written for a particular person. Now, in the case of Shakespeare's plays, we do know that he dedicated several of them to particular people. So you know who he wrote them for, but that's an indication of who paid them to paid him to write them, not necessarily that he wrote them intending to express great lines of love to that person or whatever. So the final product, the sonnets themselves are much more likely to represent what that person who hired Shakespeare wanted to see. You know, it's a lot like painting a picture. If someone commissions a painting and you put it together for them, it represents what the person paying for it wanted to see, not necessarily what the artist had put into it personally. So I guess the long version there is that I, I can't, we don't know what the inspiration, the, the who were the inspirations for Shakespeare's sonnets. I will say when it comes to the dark lady sonnets, which are the ones that people most often want to know, who's Shakespeare's dark lady? Well, that question gets debated a lot. Um, I think for me, um, I would like to see some more research into the idea that perhaps the dark lady was representative of the theater for Shakespeare. A lot of the, um, you know, I, curly hair and different things, different attributes could definitely describe, you know, an empty theater, which Shakespeare was wanting to go back to when he was writing these um, sonnets. So I like to think that the Dark Lady sonnets could have been a, playwright, a playwright's lament that he wasn't able to go in the theater at that time. But that's just, that's not substantiated. That's just me thinking through what I think it might have been. So... We always want that story, don't we? The reason behind it. There had to have been a woman has or... to be a reason, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very romantic idea to think that Shakespeare had some lover off in the wings and was secretly writing to them. But I, I don't think there's a lot of historical fact to back that up, but it certainly is a beautiful story for sure. And now we go back to Twitter and at complete Peter says this was something actually that I personally hadn't really heard much about because I don't study Shakespeare um, as much as I do the the earlier part of the Tudor period. Um, but the question was, has there been any modern efforts to illuminate his missing years after he left Stafford and be and before he became the man we think we know? Yes, is the short answer The if you're not familiar with Shakespeare, 1585, 86 to 1592 is called Shakespeare's lost years. And the reason it's called that is because we don't have evidence to specifically tie Shakespeare the man to any particular action during this time. But during this time is when you have the Babington plot against Elizabeth, Mary Queen of Scots is executed, the Spanish Armada gets defeated, Drake raids the ports of Cadiz and institutes an entire new beard style for everyone. There's numerous things going on at home in England to obscure the happenings of what would have been an all but unknown young William Shakespeare getting a start in theater. But Yes, to answer your question, there's numerous efforts trying to find out what happened to Shakespeare during these years is the holy grail for all of us in Shakespeare history stories. We would love to be able to say, I found it. I know what he was doing. Uh, many people do come close. Um, for example, in 1592, Philip Henslow starts his diary for the Lord Strange's Men, and we think Shakespeare may have been a part of that company at that time. But then you're just missing that one piece that says for sure that he was there. So, yes, there's a great great deal left to be uncovered about where he was during this time. We know he was married. We know he had his kids by this time, um, but we don't know exactly 
where he was settled and doing things. So, oh, I'm intrigued. Yeah, it's exciting. I, I'm sure. I love a good mystery. You know, like you said, everybody wants to be the one to solve it, but what a great mystery. Yes. Uh, if we go now to, let's see, let's do one from Facebook. This one was kind of a two person question. So I'm going to start with JP Morgan. And we got, we got a lot of like famous names on today. <laughs> talking um, with the top brass on Facebook. <laughs> right. We had a drug lord and <laughs> this is going to be a great episode. <laughs> it's Shakespeare for everyone. <laughs> okay. So JP Morgan said, what's the story behind his leaving his wife that particular bed upon his death. And then Teresa Masker Anderson commented on that one and said, I'd always heard that he left the guest bed to his wife because that was the best quality bed that they owned. So what can you tell us about the bed? Yes. Well, Teresa is close. Um, he did leave his second best bed to his wife, Anne. Shakespeare left this in his will. And that's significant because for one thing, Shakespeare didn't specifically leave particular items to particular people in a great abundance. So Anne being given something specific was notable. Also her being a woman and being given something specific was also notable. But the second best bed is telling about Anne and William's relationship. The best bed of a home was reserved for guests. It was the best thing that you had and you didn't use it yourself. You saved it for when people were visiting you. You wanted to show off your, your best items. And so that one was the one that didn't get used. The second best bed was the one that had been slept in daily. It was William and Anne's bed. They had shared this bed as a couple and him specifically leaving it to her is often seen as a sign of affection and love um, because he identified that one in particular needed to stay with her. Fascinating. I think that's good for everybody to learn when it comes to beds anyway. Yes. Um, on Instagram, Elena Hurley 94 says, what was Queen Elizabeth the first favorite Shakespeare play? I love this question. I have no idea, but I can tell you that my favorite instance of Queen Elizabeth asking Shakespeare to perform a play came in 1601 with a performance of Richard II. Normally this play, if it was staged, was done so without the abdication scene because that scene was considered inflammatory against the queen and she was very paranoid about people taking over her government with good reason, but still it, you had to be very careful. And it apparently had such a reputation for inciting rebellion that when the Earl of Essex wanted to drum up support for his planned insurrection and the famous Essex Rebellion. He did so by paying Shakespeare's company to perform Richard II and to specifically include the abdication scene. Essex Essex's plan, it didn't work. London didn't rise up in response to the play like he had hoped. And when Essex marched into London, he gets caught and sentenced to execution. That's an extremely condensed version of that story. But the day before he died, Queen Elizabeth I ordered Shakespeare's company to perform Richard II again for Shrove Tuesday in 1601. I don't know if her performance included the abdication scene, but I can imagine she felt very confident with this particular performance selection. And that is probably was a key moment for her in play going, I have to feel so. Thank you. And then we have D.W. Darwin also on Instagram says, was he a secret Catholic? No, he was not. Um, Shakespeare was definitely Protestant um, his whole life. It's um, this, this theory comes up about Shakespeare because there was such a back and forth between Catholicism and Protestantism in England uh, surrounding Shakespeare's life. And because John Shakespeare, William Shakespeare's father, had Catholic papers found in his house. And it was John Shakespeare who was put in charge of painting over the Catholic murals that were in the in the churches there in Stratford-upon-Avon. It was his job to cover that up. So William Shakespeare's parents were very entrenched in Catholic England and William Shakespeare grew up then in Protestant England. But by the time Shakespeare was born, the entire nation was Protestant and it was nigh unto illegal, I think it's fair to say, uh, to be anything other. So Shakespeare was baptized in a Protestant church and attended there his entire life. He was buried there in 1616. He was decidedly Protestant. And we can't know from that how he felt about Catholics or if he was sympathetic or if he personally worshipped in like a blend of Catholic and Protestantism. Um, but we have plenty of biographical evidence to suggest William Shakespeare was absolutely Protestant. 
And forgive me if you've answered this already, but once we got to this question, I started wondering, why is everybody questioning everything about William Shakespeare? Why is it, why are they worried about him being a Catholic or why are they worried about him not writing the things that were written? Why so much conspiracy around him? I don't know. I've wondered that myself. I don't know if it's just because it would be fun for to, to topple down someone that has such a longstanding legacy of success in theater and, and writing, if that's, if there's a draw there somehow. Um, I, I don't know. I, this was a new thing to me. I've studied the life of William Shakespeare for decades and I don't, I, it never occurred to me to question who he was, which I think is why I looked at the authorship question originally. I was like, oh, well, that's an interesting thought. And and then you look into it and it's like, well, no, he, he is a real person and that doesn't make sense. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but it comes up a lot. So they're really good at their marketing. All right. It's a conspiracy against him. <laughs> um, and then we have a question from Pastimes Living History that I don't really know why they're asking it. So I'm going to ask it and, and let you explain. They want to know, did he spend time in Italy? I don't know what the significance of that is. This question comes up a lot, actually, in, in Shakespeare studies. And it's because Shakespeare writes about Italy in a lot of his plays, and he does so pretty accurately. And so the question always comes up, how did he know all of this about Italy? How was he able to include this in his plays? And I think modern Shakespeare scholarship thinks that, no, Shakespeare, at least with the evidence we found so far, he did not himself travel to Italy. Um, however, travel to Italy, as well as immigration from Italy to England and specifically to London during Shakespeare's lifetime was prolific. So the like the fencing masters who came to England and set up shop were from Italy, for example, and Italy was tremendously fashionable. Remember, this is the time of the Renaissance and anything coming out of Italy was attractive and something you wanted to to do and be and participate in. And so that really accounts not only for Shakespeare's frequent use of Italy for settings in his plays as something his audience would want to see, but it also accounts for how he's able to write about Italy so accurately without having gone there himself. Okay. And I think this is going to be the last question. And of course I have to leave the last question. The last question has to be a political question with the atmosphere that we're in right now. This one is from Douglas Breeden. I think it was on Twitter. Douglas submitted his question and it was about how much of Shakespeare's history plays were influenced by the political situation he faced in his life. Oh, tons. Um, there were they were significantly influenced by the political situation he faced in life. Um, I'll give you some great examples. In Richard II, we already talked about he couldn't include the abdication scene because of modern for Shakespeare, fears that Elizabeth would see it as a threat. During the time, Shakespeare was writing Henry V and referencing arrows, bowmen, archers, and archery in dozens of his plays. There was actually this cultural movement going on between the longbow and the newer weapons arriving on the military scene. One scholar, Lynn Tribble, actually um, did some research into this and argues that the glaring omission of longbows from Shakespeare's portrayal of Agincourt were even though longbows were a pivotal weapon at that battle, really are telling about Shakespeare's society and when he was writing that play. Another one that's really great is that when Elizabeth I was just a young girl, her father, Henry VIII, was given a gift of a large 160-pound gun, and it was called a basilisk. It was capable of firing at, destructively at the enemy. You fire this thing, and it destroys everything. And it was given to Henry VIII as a gift for Elizabeth, and it became known as Elizabeth's pocket pistol when she would go on to use it against the Spanish Armada in 1588. When Shakespeare invokes this military reputation of the basilisk in Henry V, he has the, the line, the fatal balls of murdering basilisks. And Shakespeare's applying a double meaning there, first alluding to the ammunition and then adding this ferocity to what she's saying. But it's also an example of an anachronism since that weapon didn't exist until it was first built in 1544. So it was a famous weapon for William Shakespeare and a nod to Queen Elizabeth for him to use it in his play. But he that wouldn't have been there for Henry V when the play is supposedly happening. And another slip up by Shakespeare 
historically concerns the turkey. It occurs in perhaps what is Shakespeare's best known reference to turkey, and it's in Henry the Sixth, Part One. The first character, the first carrier, says. Odd's body, the turkeys in my pannier are quite starved. And he, anyway, there's a whole scene. You should see the play. But the turkey wasn't actually in England during the time that this play is supposedly set. So there, it's it's included in there because the the turkey was unknown in England until the reign of Henry the Eighth. So again, Shakespeare is putting plugs for Elizabeth and Henry the Eighth and and very pro England things into his plays that are very, very true for Shakespeare when he's writing them, but they weren't necessarily true for the history they're supposed to represent. Cassidy, thank you so much for answering everybody's questions today. This was really fun. Thank you for submitting questions. This was really great conversation. Thanks for having me. Where can everybody find you and your work? Absolutely. You can come find me at CassidyCash.com. A lot of the questions that you've asked today, we have guest experts over on that Shakespeare life who've addressed them way more in depth than what I shared with you here. So be sure to check us out over there, castycash.com. I'm also on Pinterest, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So you can find me there as well. And I will include links in the show notes as well. Thanks again, Cassidy. Thank you so much. And now a brief history. Thanks to the nine day queen, Jane, there isn't much room for extra scandal in the Gray family. Not unless you look a little closer at her younger sister, Catherine. Lady Catherine Grey was born on August 25th, 1540, to Henry Grey, 1st Duke of Suffolk, and Lady Frances Brandon. Catherine's paternal grandfather was the grandson of Queen Elizabeth Woodville by her first marriage to Sir John Grey, and her maternal grandmother was Mary Tudor, the younger sister to King Henry VIII. In 1553, as King Edward VI lay dying, together with his chief minister, John Dudley, 1st Duke of Northumberland, he intended to exclude the king's Catholic half-sister Mary from the line of succession and install the Protestant lady Jane Grey. Not soon after, Catherine was declared second in the line, behind her sister and any male heirs Jane may have had. In May of that year, while Jane married Northumberland's son, Guildford Dudley, Catherine also married Henry Herbert, son of William Herbert, 1st Earl of Pembroke. Unfortunately, as we know, Jane did not remain queen for long, and she was executed. As he did not want to be associated with the shame and dishonor of the situation, Catherine's father-in-law sought the marriage be annulled. Throughout her time at court in the years of Mary I and Elizabeth I's reign, Catherine befriended Jane Seymour. Not that Jane Seymour but the daughter of Lord Protector Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset. Jane introduced her brother Edward Seymour, 1st Earl of Hertford, to Catherine, and the pair's affection was immediate. In 1560, rather than seeking Queen Elizabeth's permission to marry, Seymour and Catherine wed in a secret ceremony, with the only witness being her friend and new sister-in-law, Jane. When the queen sent Edward away on a circuit across Europe, he left his new bride with a document proving the validity of their marriage and confirming her right to inherit his property. The existence of this record proved to be of the utmost importance when in 1561, Jane Seymour died of tuberculosis, having been the only bystander at the wedding. However, in a disastrous twist seen only in the movies, Catherine lost the document and was therefore unable to prove the union. They also had no access to the officiant who performed the ceremony, leaving Queen Elizabeth to decide herself whether or not she accepted their union, should she find out. To make matters worse, Catherine found herself with child. By this point, Catherine was a genuine threat to Queen Elizabeth's position on the throne, and it was imperative that her marriage to Seymour be valid. She had lived a life of contempt for Elizabeth, being brought up to view her as the illegitimate child of an adulterer and traitor. Knowing that her potential bearing of sons was significant in both staking a claim to the throne and preventing a rebellion to overthrow Elizabeth during her time as monarch. She remained silent and was able to disguise her growing belly for much of her pregnancy. But by her eighth month, she became frantic and needed someone on her side to appeal to the queen on her behalf. She went to Bess of Hardwick, pleading for help, but Bess refused to listen and scolded her for putting her in such a precarious situation in the first place. In another unusual and most likely desperate act, she then went to her brother-in-law, the queen's favorite, 
Robert Dudley as a last ditch effort for help. Not only did he not comply, but he went straight to Elizabeth and told her everything. Now, Elizabeth was not necessarily known for her ability to reason, and this information did not elicit a positive response from her. She put both Catherine and Bess in the tower, as she was not convinced that Bess wasn't involved in a scheme to use Catherine's child to overthrow her. Seymour was sent for, and he was also imprisoned in the tower. There, Catherine gave birth to Edward Seymour, Lord Beecham, in 1561. In May of 1562, it was declared by the Archbishop of Canterbury that there was, in fact, no lawful marriage between Catherine and Edward. Their charge? Fornication. As if the situation weren't theatrical enough, the lieutenant of the tower, Edward Warner, agreed to allow the couple to see one another during their imprisonment. Assuming he was doing the kind thing for them, Warner did not plan for the second pregnancy that occurred during these visits. After the birth of Seymour and Catherine's younger son, Thomas, in 1563, the couple were ordered to permanently separate. They were not permitted to have any physical or even written contact. Catherine was placed under house arrest in the custody of her uncle, Lord John Gray. She was permitted to take Thomas with her, but their eldest son, Edward, and Seymour were sent to live with his mother. Lady Catherine Gray spent the next seven years in several different homes and prisons and died on January 26, 1568. Her guardian at the time tried to help her get to a point of contentment, but Catherine's response was simply, No, no, my lady. My time has come, and it is not God's will that I should live any longer and his will be done, not mine. As I am, so shall you be, behold the picture of yourselves. She asked that they take the following message to the queen as well. I must needs confess I have greatly offended her in that I made my choice without her knowledge. Otherwise I take God to witness I had never the heart to think any evil against her majesty. She asked that Queen Elizabeth not take her actions out on her sons and remain somewhat forgiving towards them. Furthermore, she asked that she forgive Seymour. Catherine returned her wedding ring to him, as well as a small collection of other gifts, including a ring engraved with the words, While I live, yours. At only 27 years old, Gray passed away potentially of consumption, but also possibly due to the anorexia many say she suffered, as she was too heartbroken and weak to eat after never having seen her beloved Edward again. The story of Catherine Gray and her beloved Edward is one of passion, intrigue, and unfortunately, desolation. Some feel sorry for her while others find her actions reckless and irresponsible. But regardless of your position, it is fair to say that her story deserves to be told, and the shadow of her sister's tale should cloud hers no longer. And that concludes this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. You can find my show notes from this episode and how to become a patron at TutorsDynastyPodcast.com. Don't want to miss an episode? Be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Patreon, Podbean, or anywhere you can find podcasts. Thanks for checking out the Tudors Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TutorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudors Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.